Bradley Beal to the Phoenix Suns. It happened. Happy Father's Day to everybody. On today's episode of Locked On Suns, we'll react to the move, the fit, what comes next, and what it all means. Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past six seasons, a writer at suns.com and the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen Sunday afternoon, an emergency bonus episode of the podcast. This is normally when we record, but typically there is no pressure to get it up first thing. In this case, Bradley Beal is coming to Phoenix, which means it is the perfect Time to be finding this show if you haven't seen us before. So hit follow or subscribe wherever you are finding this podcast. We're free and available everywhere, including YouTube. We're here every day, not just when Beal becomes a son. So if you go ahead and hit that button, you'll get a show in your feed every single day, getting you up to date, locked on to your favorite team, the Phoenix Suns. Be coming every day or come along for this insane offseason ride right along with us. Joining me as he does every single Monday is Brandon Duenas. He is a writer over at brightsideofthesun.com. We're going to dive into what this deal looked like, what is coming next, and how Beal fits on the cap, on the team, and get hyped over the latest Suns edition, a big three in the Valley. First today's show brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. Okay, Brandon, I'll give you the floor. I talked a lot about what this deal might look like, my thoughts, everything. People probably already know a little bit of that. They want to hear some hype. They want to hear some analysis. What do you got for us? What was your first reaction when you saw this deal come down? Well, look, I I don't know where to start at this point. Um, (laughs) So I'll start with this. I'll backtrack a little bit here and just give a thank you to Chris Paul for everything he's done to this organization. I think uh, his addition really helped teach Devin Booker and uh, not just the entire Suns and young core how to win. And I, I think it'd be remiss of us not to include that in this segment. So uh, wishing Chris Paul the best. On that note, though, <laughs> Bradley Beal is a Phoenix Sun, and I'm very, yeah. very excited. I think uh, last year, a lot of people kind of threw out the, the term super team uh, when it came to the Suns. I didn't really buy into that hype because I didn't think they had a super team. I think they had an aging point guard that was past his prime. I'm going to say that after I just complimented Chris Paul, because I think that's still true. Um, They had a center that was disengaged, not playing the best that we've seen him, um, along with two superstars. Now you had a third star. Now this is a super team. And and to me, that's exciting. There's still a lot of like legwork. They have to figure out how to build this roster around them, which we'll kind of dive into. But this is an exciting time to be a Suns fan. And I think that the the trade dropping today wasn't as shocking as that initial tweet was for me, at least like <laughs> yeah. initially, like just because that, that kind of caught everyone off guard, I feel like it came out of nowhere. And to me, that was kind of like the bomb that was like, okay, this is this is gonna happen. Uh, because typically with Suns info, it doesn't get leaked out like that. Um unless so, other people know about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that was more of a surprise. Today was kind of a shock in terms of timing, just because we were shout out to Damon All- Allred. He was he's about to come <laughs> on. We we're going to talk about the draft today, and uh, that kind of got canceled. So you know, not going to lie, a little more excited to talk Beal than Amani Bates. All you know, <laughs> salute to Amani Bates. Hopefully, he has a great career. A um, little more hyped to to break down Bradley Beal. Um, yeah, look, I think um, that's a great way to put it. I think once it got out that he was angling for a a trade to Phoenix and you know that he has a no trade clause you know how much sway that can have I mean not sway it's it's literally control over the process and the fact that you know people were throwing around old stories of Kobe Bryant was going to be a bull and then he said no and this and that you just started to realize you know and even in the moment doing the podcast uh yesterday I was like I'm not even sure if I'm putting enough stock into it now but I definitely didn't put enough stock into it 
last week when it became clear the Wizards were going to move Beal, period. And I just started the whole podcast. I literally think my cold open, those first 15 seconds people see before the intro, I said, Bradley Beal's not going to be his son, but that's okay. Everybody should clip that and send it to me everywhere that you possibly can and tell me how wrong I am because I was absolutely wrong, but it really was all about that no trade clause. So to see it finally come together now, not a huge surprise. I echo what you said about Chris Paul. I hope I can find some more time to discuss his impact and everything as the days go by, but right now obviously is the time for what's new and what's going on now. Um, So the package is Landry Shamit and Chris Paul. And then what we only know now as being multiple second round picks and swaps. Now, what I'll say about the swaps is I don't really see a world in which over the next few years, the Suns would ever have uh, a better draft pick than the Washington Wizards. So I'm not sure that those pick swaps will really matter, but it is all that the Suns really had to trade after giving up so much for Durant. So I'm sure the Wizards were like, you have to do that too. And the Suns were like, okay, whatever. Um, And then second round picks, we'll see how many it ends up being. Landry Shamit, I think nobody, you know, fair or unfair, I don't think any Suns fans are going to be all that upset to see him leave. Even at his best, he is just a role player, just a bench player. And, you know, maybe he finds a home and finally makes an impact, but that had not happened yet. So that's what we're talking about. And that's really where I came down, Brandon, as I was talking through it. As I said, I was against the idea of a third star at the beginning of the offseason when I thought it was going to have to be something a little more complicated or at least a little more um, expensive in terms of the trade haul. And then if it was going to be so little, which now we know it was, I can at least understand it. And the reason is, as much as we can all sit there and say, well, if they had been able to get this third like sort of scorer, this third option, who maybe plays a little better defense or fits a little more naturally and this and that. We can all dream up what that guy might be in our minds. We can all pretend as if, you know, I don't know, there was some Malcolm Brogdon chatter. Maybe in your in your mind you feel like if you give up a little less, Brogdon is a little more of a natural fit. Okay, but that's all imaginative. That's all imaginary. There's no actual, actual pathway that we know of to getting any player like that. There was a pathway to getting Beal. And so that's why, I, at the end of the day, I just think it was something you probably had to do because your opportunity was right there to get a guy who was going to be that third option for you, whereas all the other pathways and options and possibilities might not have happened. And then you could have been sitting there with Durant, Booker, and a lot of the same guys we saw in that Denver series toward the end. No, exactly. You kind of nailed it there. And I think a lot of the offseason imagination is ranged from – Gabe Vincent and uh, Terry Rozier to like all these guys that, you know, they they could be good fits in the system, but it's more like, okay, we just added another guy that can drop 30 at any moment. And what did we really give up? Like, you have to kind of like, look at that, like, okay, yes, we're not going to be able to have the full mid-level. That's, you know, that's where some, some dreams die with certain players that or fits we liked. But um, I think the flexibility now with Beal, uh, Booker and Durant, you could try to ship Aiton off for some depth. You can you can do some other creative things. And I think a lot of vets that want to win a ring, they're going to come here. So yeah, they're, they're going to want to come here. And like we've kind of said that in the past a little bit. And it's not like the Suns were favorites uh, this this past or not favorites, but they're, they're kind of in that favorite group where they're at the top of the league where vets will be interested. But now you have this trio, vets that are trying to get a payday, especially they're going to want to come to Phoenix and get open looks. Um, so to me, it's like, yes, there, there's some limited roster construction things that not just this year, but for the foreseeable future that are real. And like, you have to factor that in. So I'm not trying to be a party pooper here, but uh, that's just kind of the reality of the situation. But at the same time, it's like, there's, there was not a better fit in terms of this guy's going to be your third option and yeah. he can hit corner threes. He can slash. And I think, between him and Booker, they're both kind of underrated slashers in terms of like their athleticism and finishing. So that's something that excites me as well. I think the off ball stuff with Beal, especially with the less um, lesser workload of having to like create his own shot, he can do some more creative stuff off ball, working off Durant and Booker. Durant's a great facilitator. That's kind of an underrated part of his game too. So um, offensively, I feel like this, this honestly has a chance to be one of the greatest offenses of all time. I will say that right now. Uh, I, I just, I will throw that out there, I think. And it's not that far-fetched, but... I mean, I, I uh, it's funny because it's like, well, 
somebody's going to set that record every single season going forward. It feels like, mm-hmm. you know, the Kings just had the best offense of all time. So if you think about it that way, it's like, well, you're probably right. But I get your your, your point is totally well taken. And I think really to me, it's kind of like the playoff offense, right? I mean, yeah. Denver just set the record. I don't know if it was a, a record ever, but I would imagine it was with like a 120 offensive rating in the postseason. They were number one. The Suns are going to push for that. The Suns are going to have answers. You just think how often we were, you know, punching ourselves, feeling like if if just one more guy could step up in that Denver series, in two games that they won, it was Shamit and it was TJ Warren. And now that guy's going to be Bradley Beal, you know, and the Suns turn exactly. Chris Paul, who we did, you know, a week of chatter about here in Suns world about if you stretched him or waved him outright. And now he turned into Bradley Beal. Like it's sort of like second round picks are, are nothing. You can buy those. The Suns very well might buy one in, in three days. You know, those aren't mm. really that, that uh, valuable of assets. Shamit is somebody that Suns fans didn't even want on the team anymore. Chris Paul might've been stretched and then pick swaps. I just said probably weren't even going to be used um, or won't be, I mean, because the Suns will probably have a bad pick every year, even if they kept their own pick, and they probably will keep their own pick because it won't swap. So it's like, what did you give up? You know, and you it's, just got a, a an all Sorry NBA to cut player. You off. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off, but it's an absolute fleece, and it's just right place, right time that the yeah. Suns so often have not been in. And for the Beal's contract to line up to where he has that no trade clause and he controls his destination, that's exactly why. Booker and Durant, that combination attracts stars. That's why you do yeah. that in Mikel Bridges trade. So it's just, it's right place, right time. Um, absolute fleece. Matt Ishbia is a sicko <laughs> and I love him for his aggressiveness. All right. So let's talk about Beal's salary and some of that stuff that you were getting to with uh, building out the roster. The Suns are not going to have much in the way of flexibility. We don't know if they would have even without this Beal deal, but this pretty much cemented it. We'll get into the second apron and all these types of things just to give people an idea of where they're headed. But I wanted to cap off the segment to illustrate what we're saying here. There's a tweet from uh, at the Xavier Joseph going around right now that says, Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, Chris Paul, Landry Shamit, four firsts and a couple seconds got you Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal. (laughs) And it's sort of like, yeah, That's where we are. Not only Chris Paul, but 38-year-old Chris Paul, who has been injured in three consecutive postseasons. Really, like, six consecutive postseasons. So, that's what we're looking at. That is what helped build the super team, which I think it is fair to say, at least on the offensive end, for sure. But let's get into some of those domino effects and just what this will look like. Uh, We'll try not to get too nerdy or, or, you know, uh, ran on anybody's parade, but it is a big part of this, and it will matter as people are thinking about what comes next. First, today's show brought to you by Ibotta. Watching your closet grow after purchasing all of this season's latest trends. I don't know. In Arizona, we just try to stay cool for the most part, but maybe that is you. Ibotta can help you stop spending your hard-earned money without getting anything returned. You can earn cash back on every shopping trip. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods. The average Ibotta User earns $120 back in real cash per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip for the grocery store or maybe your latest, uh, you know, whatever you've been looking at over on the internet or wherever you like to shop. A typical basket of groceries is over $50 more expensive by the end of 2022 than the beginning of the previous year due to inflation. You could earn two and a half times that in cash back from Ibotta. You can also turn that into uh gift cards at places like lowe's macy's sephora best buy and more or a simple paypal or more cash gift card whatever you prefer right now ibotta is offering our listeners five dollars just for trying ibotta by using the code locked when you register so just go to the app store or google play store download the free ibotta app and use the code locked when you make your first or when you register that's ibotta in the google player app store promo code locked All right, Brandon. So uh, Bobby Marks has had some good stuff. He is the cap guy over at ESPN. Basically, Chris Paul guaranteed about 10 more of his salary, $10 million more in his salary. He still could be cut by whatever team ultimately gets him. It sounds like he may be rerouted. Not really Suns fans problem anymore, but that's kind of what made this work. The bottom line is that Bradley Beal makes 43.3 million this year. And I believe, uh, I don't know the exact number. About like 163 million, I think, is where the three, uh, the four players are between Durant, Booker, Beal, and Ayton. 
And the Suns are now projected to be a second apron team, which is about $179 million when you remember they also have to fill out their roster. So 163 is just one part of that, but they still have to add the other 11 guys to their roster. That puts them over that second apron for at least the next three seasons, meaning they basically just have minimums to fill out the rest of their roster. Um, Do you feel like, I, I guess where my mind goes kind of digesting all of that, Brandon, is I sort of feel like that means maybe the guys on the Suns roster already are more likely to come back. I don't know where, what you think about that. Yeah, for sure. And and just to kind of build off your point of Bobby Marks putting out great content, uh, for any Suns fans wondering, no, Chris Paul cannot come back to the Suns if the Wizards waive him. Um, that was That's something that is not going to happen. So you, we can officially pour one out for, for Chris Paul and just kind of let that die. But as, as far as like your point of, Game six uh, against players. the Clippers will live on forever. Yes. Absolutely. Iconic. Absolutely. So um, I hope he lands in a good spot for him. And, uh, you know, the Clippers have already been linked to him. But yeah, but, yeah, but to get to your point, yeah, I think uh, so guys like Kogi, TJ Warren, uh, Jock Landale, um, all probably more likely to come back. Uh, Torrey Craig as well. But like we kind of talked about before, I don't know if it's going to be both Craig and Warren. It's probably going to be one or the other. Um, but I think a Kogi should be a priority. You need some on-ball defense. Point of attack should be a priority uh, this offseason. And um, the, like you said, the, the margin for error gets a lot thinner with the situation they're in cap-wise now. You have to make sure that these these are the right fits uh, that you bring in. And whoever you're guaranteeing playing time to in, in these pitches to bring them in on a vet min that – Maybe they typically wouldn't accept that, um, that they're they're going to be ideal fits next to this big three. So I think that's that's the next step for James Jones and uh, Matt Ishbia, Trevor Buckstein, even just whoever's involved in that conversation, just making sure they're, they're targeting the right guys um, at the right salaries. And and uh, I think there's still more moves to come for sure. There's there's a draft that they can try to, you know, find themselves in somehow if they if they trade DeAndre and then. Um, there, there's other avenues too, to try to acquire a second round pick, but you look at what, uh, Christian Brown did and it should be Braun. I'll, I'll die on that hill, but Christian Brown for, for the Nuggets yeah. was a in- instrumental piece. That's not going to happen every year, but there's, there's guys that in those first two, three years that can make impact. So I think the draft is another area where the Suns they should take it seriously and, and try to add a uh, back end rotation piece through there if they can, um, but yeah, it's 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 interesting. The, the roster construction now becomes uh, a lot more clear. You have three guys that can go for thirty anytime you want them to. Yeah, and the regular season becomes a little bit easier because now if Durant does have to miss a few games, you saw Booker and Beal. You could win. You could still rattle off, you know, five out of six wins, and say Durant misses like six games with an ankle sprain or something. So, um, I mean, and the thing is too, right? Like, I think there's a unique sort of part of this as well, where I don't mean that like, this is going to sound very Homerish, but it is what it is. I, I believe it. Um, Booker Beal and Durant are already making the max of the max of the max. You know what I mean? So Booker mm-hmm. has already gotten his super max and he might even end up with another one. If, if his career goes the way we all think it might, I mean, he's, he's only paid through age 31. There might even be another one there for him, but he doesn't have to worry about that for a long time. Beal stayed in Washington for years and years in order to get the contract that he's currently now on. Kevin Durant's made all the money in the world and he's making the most he can possibly make everything else. So I think that there will be a little bit of an understanding of what this is, right? This is a sacrifice in some ways, you know, I think Beal probably will have to sacrifice the most, but he just chose to come here. And the other two guys, it's just about winning a championship. Durant has two, yeah. but I would imagine he still is driven by winning one. Booker has been very close three straight years or relatively close three straight years, and he wants that more than anything. It's the only thing left for him. You know, they'll, they'll want to make all-star teams in all-NBA, but the freaking uh, restrictions on all NBA and stuff. Now, maybe guys won't even care about that. This is only about winning a championship. And so I do think that if, yeah, okay. So, you know, book needs the night off, Durant needs the night off or guys are injured or whatever. The goal will be, can we be healthy for tip off of game one of the first round? And that'll be it. And I think that having guys who are all sort of on the wave, same wavelength in their careers will really matter, um, for that. I want to let everybody know about the second apron, what I'm, what we mean when we're talking about that, because I think it's already kind of getting thrown around online, and I don't know if people are always really explaining what it means, but basically there will be 
limits to no taxpayer mid-level exception, which is why we're talking about only minimums. So the taxpayer mid-level is pretty small anyway, but that's like what Dante DiVincenzo got from the Warriors, for instance. The Suns don't get access to that now that they're projected to be over that second apron. They don't. Uh, they can't sign buyout players. They can't take more money back in trades than they're receiving. Um, I think there's a few more on top of that. But the Suns are basically deciding this is our team. And some of that doesn't go all go into effect at once. That's the part where I'm a little cloudy, if I'm being honest. Um, but that's kind of what they're in for. So long as they keep things in place. I did talk about in the original show that I did on Saturday that if the Suns made a subsequent move to get rid of DeAndre Ayton and potentially bring back smaller salaries within that, um, that could be a way to free up a little money. They're probably still going to be over the second apron, but maybe just a little more flexibility that allows them to go out and get a second or first round pick and just have the bill not be too, too high, although it's not my money, so what do I care? But to cap off this segment, and we'll get to Ayton in a second, Brandon, to your point, I just wanted to read off because I think the best example of what you're talking about is the 2020-21 Nets in terms of veteran players flocking to that team. That team had... LaMarcus Aldridge, Bruce Brown, uh, Jeff Green, Blake Griffin, Iman Shumpert played there for a little while, Noah Vonley trying to resuscitate his career, DeAndre Jordan, obviously not on a minimum, but on a pretty big contract, um, and, and an assortment of other players. That is what happens when you have, you know, three superstars. The next year, they get Paul Millsap on that team, Patty Mills comes to that team, Blake Griffin sticks around, Andre Drummond makes an appearance. Marcus Aldridge stays there and everything else. So I just think that illustrates what we're talking about here in terms of the types of players that might want to come here on even a small contract, which it would basically have to be the minimum, uh, even if it's not a big payday, just to come, come and try to win or re, you know reinvent their career, figure out a new role for themselves, et cetera, et cetera. But let's talk about an Aiton deal. I think that's the, the next obvious domino to look forward to. I'll ask Brandon what he thinks. I think some people might already know what I think, but we'll get into it next. First, today's show brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks has come in and fixed daily fantasy sports. It used to be complicated, obnoxious. You felt like you were getting gamed and hustled by people left and right, but Prize Picks is much more simple. There's no pool, no league, no head to head. It is just you versus the Prize Picks player projections. Just pick two to six players, and if they will score more or less than that projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. They offer projections across all sports. The WNBA is going on. Obviously, tennis and golf go throughout the summer, and then by the fall, we'll have the baseball playoffs, football will be back, and everything else. They have everything in every sport. Entries can be made quickly. They offer safe and fast withdrawals, and they're currently operational in over 30 states, including Arizona as well as Canada. So download the PricePix app now. Go to PricePix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. That means if you deposit 100, PricePix matches that right back into your account. So don't forget to enter the promo code Locked On at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Dollars. All right, let's close out here. A few more minutes on this, Brandon. I think uh, the next big domino is going to be DeAndre Ayton. Do they keep him and have him be their starting center and do all the stuff we thought he might be able to do under Frank Vogel? Or is this just a forecasting of what might come next, which would be trading Ayton to get a little bit more depth? Now, there still are some of those rules. It's not going to be easy. We know the Ayton market is not perfect. But if you could even just turn that into a couple of guys instead of one guy, I feel like with the way the Suns roster is set up, that might be enough. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think with DeAndre, my entire tune has kind of changed with this trade just because now I feel more comfortable keeping him than I did, you know, two hours ago in terms of like if, if the right trade does not come along, um, you know, just fill the team with vet men's. You already have four of your five starters. And obviously there's, there's still some concerns with, with touches and everything now that you have another 25 plus point score added in the mix that you're trying to incorporate already. So how happy will he be in an even lesser role offensively? I don't know, but I mean, at this point there, there's so many trade options that I think could make sense. It's just now about would the Suns actually get at least two rotation players that can make your playoff rotation uh, from that eight and trade. And that that's the key because if it's just, if it's like a one for one or like a one for two where you're just getting back like a back end bench piece yeah. and someone that's worse than Aiton at that point, keep DeAndre, let Vogel coach him up. 
Um, because you do need that defensive anchor in a Vogel system. So I'm not going to trade him just for pennies on the dollar. Um, but if you can go out and get like a Capella and Bogdanovich or Jakob Pertl and some type, type of sign and trade with Toronto, uh, San Antonio has kind of weirdly thrown themselves in the mix with the whole uh, Wembenyama rumor that they want to keep him at the four. They, they want someone to guard centers on their team. Um, I don't know so, why they. I don't know why the Pertle trade happened from any direction. I don't know why Toronto gave up a first for him. I don't know why the Spurs got rid of him. To be honest with you, just, weird, weird stuff. Classic NBA uh, teams <laughs> desperation. I, I don't know. There's there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in the trade deadline. So um, off season, I, I expect some chaos. Yeah. There's there's going to be some team that comes out of nowhere that probably enters the in sweepstakes. Uh, well, that's what I was going to say. Team. Is I think that. In a strange way, one of the things that might happen here is that the Suns probably will have to be patient with an Aiton deal. It might come as like a second or like a plan B or plan C for another team. But in a way, having everything locked so locked in elsewhere for the Suns, it's kind of like they can afford to be patient because they're not giving up any flexibility. Whether they trade Aiton or not, all they're going to be able to do is minimums and re-signing their own guys. So 100%, yeah. find some guys, some find some vets who they can get on minimums. And then if, you know, mid July, late July, some teams like, man, I guess we just got to do this eight and thing. Okay, great. We got some more flexibility and, and we, you know, we move along and, and, you know, as the front office, I'm, if I'm Phoenix, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Cause it's a nice little late summer surprise. Yeah. And, and what I've heard is like, just kind of keep an eye on the whole Portland Dame thing. If he ends up in Miami and Toronto's out of that, uh, there's no discussion there between those two, two teams. It could, lead to some chaos. So uh, Toronto's a team that I've been kind of looking at for a while that has been linked. They almost pulled up the trigger on a trade for Aiton uh, this past season. So it would not shock me at all if, if uh, some Portland trades or Portland talk broke down and led to that path. But, but yeah, like you said, there's there's no rush for the Suns. Just kind of let things play out. Let a couple dominoes fall. If, if, if a team becomes interested in, in the right deal, uh, approaches you, you take it. If not, like I said, don't trade DeAndre for peanuts at this point. So uh, you're, you're already going to be filling out a lot of your roster with veteran minimums at this point. So uh, if you – worst case scenario, you keep DeAndre and just keep doing that, just find the vet mins, and I would take that at this point. That, that's a good plan B to me. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean – I'm looking at, I literally just went to spot track and, and looked up NBA free agents and organized by experience to try to see who are the old guys who might, you know, uh, see Phoenix as a desirable landing spot. I'm, I'm not loving what I'm seeing if I'm being completely honest, but, um, I don't know, you know, like Reggie Jackson, I, people have talked about Jay Crowder, uh, Jeff Green, you know, you're talking about that's that's more on the the much older side. But does Dennis Schroeder not get a better offer? Does Seth Curry accept a minimum? Mason Plumley, somebody we've thrown out there before. Um, I think you know, start to familiarize yourself with those names, maybe because that might be kind of uh, where the Suns are are selecting from. I guess I agree with you that this maybe doesn't this maybe makes it a little bit more okay to accept something uh, to, to not accept something that's not good enough from an Aiton standpoint. I guess I would just say I would be worried if you're looking at a situation where, you know, even for a, a decent, let's say Durant has another injury, even if it's not like a, like a serious physical thing, it still happens to him most, most years at this point. It basically ever since the AC or uh, the Achilles, it's, it's kind of been a, a likelihood. I just would be a little worried if you're talking about, okay, you know, we traded, uh, we kept Aiton, but Durant's out and and now our starting lineup for a significant portion of the season is like, you know, Payne, Booker, Beal. I guess it's not that different than what the Suns starting lineup was for stretches last year and they still won 45 games, but you just don't want to let it get too thinned out where if there is an injury you start you get like way worse because I think you should expect there will be injuries I mean all three of these guys have missed time here and there over the past few years so you don't want to get you don't want to rely too much on like Jeff Green to play 30 minutes a game for three months you know yeah no absolutely I mean depth matters 100 percent the 
uh, regular season matters too. I think that's kind of something that's been sort of tossed around as an idea recently that you can just kind of coast and things will be fine. And I think Denver is a perfect example of that continuity, that depth, uh, it does matter. So there's, there's two different ways to look at it. There's, there's one where yes, uh, having, you know, in a perfect world where all four of your guys are healthy, like the Suns, big four, there's talent wise, there's no one that can really compete with that. But what are the odds that all four of those guys are healthy entering the playoffs? Just looking at it realistically, they're, they're not great. So you have to build your team that um, can withstand those injuries. Um, obviously, the, the whole regular season is about load management. So if you can kind of create a system where you can manage Booker, Beal, and Durant simultaneously and still win games, that's that's the best case scenario. So I think trading eight in four depth uh, helps in that regard, but at the same time, um, you can't always predict what's going to happen with injuries. So it's, it's really, it's really tough. It's kind of balancing both worlds. Um, so I get both sides of it. Like I, like I said, I think personally, I would like to move on from Aiden because I think it's best for both parties. Um, if the right deal comes along, but at the same time, if, if it's just, you know, we're just getting garbage back, there's, there's no point of, of sending the sending through a trade where you're just going to get worse and it's not going to help with either of the scenarios we're talking about. Good place to wrap it up. Thank you everybody for coming to locked on Suns after this deal. Not what I thought we would be talking about the Monday of the draft. Uh, did not see this coming, did not expect this, but very exciting stuff. I'm very, I like, I, I hate this time of year at the same time too, because now I'm just like, can we get to October? Like I, I already just want to watch it, you know, but uh, that's how it goes. Uh, you can read Brandon at Bright Side of the Sun. You can hit follow or subscribe to find me on this feed every single day. We'll be back tomorrow with more. I don't know. I don't know what it'll be. Maybe they'll get a fourth uh, superstar player. Who knows? We don't We don't even have a clue at this point in time with everything that the Suns seem to be. Can't, you can't pursuing. rule it out with Ishbia. That, like no, if there's I mean, another bomb that drops tomorrow, I will not be shocked. for Lillard? I don't know. I mean, that'll be their point guard. They just, they just got rid of Chris <laughs> Paul. They need a one. So, you know, campaign, non-guarantee, Aiton, you know. A handful Lillard, of seconds. Lillard, come on down. Uh, but that'll wrap us up, guys. In the meantime, check out Locked On NBA. Check out, check out Locked On Sports today. I have a feeling I may or may not be on both of those shows. Uh, so if you want more of me talking about this, that's where you can go. Uh, I will check you guys out tomorrow.